I think the numbers are pretty steady right now. So I think we'll go ahead and get started, everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure to virtually welcome uh, Scott Roy, uh, who's going to share his work with us today. Um, I'll say, he's, as somebody who works on splicing, sometimes after I give a talk, one of the questions I often get is people coming up to me and asking, why on earth did this evolve? This seems utterly insane. This makes no sense. <laughs> and, um, you know, Scott tries to answer <laughs> those questions, I think. And I think um, what you'll see is like some of the, you know, certainly for me, many of his findings are, are really quite surprising, you know, even for someone who works in splicing and thinks about this uh, day to day. So I've learned personally quite a lot about the splicing machinery and, and its biology by, by listening to Scott and reading his papers. And so I think that um, you guys will be will uh, uh, be surprised and, and you'll come away, I think, thinking a lot about you know, the life of, of, of the intron and, and uh, you know, its history on Earth. And so with that, uh, I'll uh, hand it over to Scott. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'd like to thank Aaron and all, all my hosts for uh, facilitating my, uh, my pseudo visit. Uh, I had really hoped to come in person, um, but uh, two, two factors intervened versus uh, that um, down here, you have two pictures of, of where we live. We live on the houseboat community in Sausalito, just north of San Francisco. And we we really love it. We've been there for a year. Um, but that means that my wife, who's still a postdoc, uh, is trying to find out a long term uh, permanent job uh, that wouldn't require our moving from this community. And lo and behold, next week, she has an interview at University of San Francisco, which is the closest um, the, the closest university to us. Um, so our fingers are very much crossed. And we have this tiny little baby that we I am mostly uh, I am primary child care for right now. Uh, and so I did not want to leave her there for three days. And Aaron tells me that it might have been more than three days with the coming storm. Anyway, I really wish I could be there in person. I hope to have a chance to meet with people. If anybody uh, is interested in talking to me about my work, um, my email is easy to find. It's just Roy at SFSU, uh, San Francisco State University. Um, so please do get in touch. Sorry to not be with you in person, hopefully someday. Okay, so some preliminaries. Um, as all uh, my first two slides are going to be sort of about how weird my talk and my um, and my career are, uh, but I just want to be forthright about that. So first, thanks. Um, a, a, unif a, a central feature of my career, as it's been experienced, is that I'm uh, kind of a weirdo. Um, so as Aaron said, um, Aaron and there's a large field uh, of people working on the mechanism of the spliceosome, uh, why there, uh, um, how splicing occurs. Uh, how it's different between yeast and other organisms, these sorts of questions. Um, and of course, there's a lot of people working on evolution uh, as a huge topic of research. Uh, but in terms of people who work on evolution of splicing, uh, there's me and one of my former students who have primarily dedicated our careers to the question, period. Um, and so uh, I'm a, I'm a, I have a funny relationship to all other fields, uh, which is that I'm kind of isolated there. Um, on the other hand, I should say is all the contributions are certainly not from from just the small number of labs. Many, many labs have contributed um, important, crucial work, but those tend to be labs that don't mostly concern themselves with the question. So I don't mean to say that everything else that, that means today that I'm kind of here as a representative of the field um, and that I will kind of be integrating um, a lot of work from a lot of different labs. And yet, as Aaron said, these are kind of big questions. So it's it's a little bit surprising um, that I uh, that I'm one of so few people who has dedicated their career to the question. Um, so it's something that we're going to need to. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of my talk, or a good deal of my talk today, um, uh, trying to disabuse us of what we think we know about introns. Uh, my ex girlfriend was a psychologist, and she said it's a funny thing to be. Uh, um, an expert in because you tell people they're a psychologist and immediately they have ideas because like, everybody thinks they're a little bit of an ex expert, understandably so. With introns, there are a lot of things that we think we know. Uh, why are there introns? Why are there more in humans than in, in other species? Uh, all these sorts of things. Uh, and so we need to take some time to show specifically why I'm not why why those ideas don't work before we can move on to to what we know about the answers. As I said, I'll be talking uh, work uh, about work uh, across a whole bunch of contributors uh, who've made really important discoveries and then gone back to their non-intron evolution work. Um, I, I so given how few people are working on this, I should acknowledge a lot of these answers are are partial and preliminary. Uh, 
a lot of what I'll be doing today is eliminating hypotheses. And I would argue that these are the important eliminations because they have so much uh, psychological power and people think they know the answers. Nonetheless, um, the, 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 in, in many of these questions, the best we can get to is given what we've got left, this seems like the most compelling hypothesis and we, we need more work on it. So anybody who wants to work on intron evolution, uh, the water's warm, come on in, you are welcome. Uh, I, it's always great to have people join, join and work on it. So my goal is today to tell you one interesting story. And then, then, then uh, my long shot goal would be to help you think differently about molecular biology and the importance of evolution in understanding the machines um, that we study. Okay, so just a bit about my background. I've had a funny career, as I said. Um, as a sophomore, I, stu I stumbled into the lab of Walter Gilbert, um, who was a Nobel laureate. He got his Nobel laureate for uh, among the first DNA sequencing methods. Um, and so they were working on intron evolution. Um, so it turns out that a C plus and intro uh, computer programming back then made you a bioinformatics star, no longer, of course, but at the time. Um, and at the time, it, it was a very, very vibrant field. So the people I've listed here, the first two are Nobel laureates, and the others are all members of the National Academy that were working specifically not just on introns, but on the question of why are there introns in intron evolution. So I ended up staying uh, in the Gilbert lab with my PhD because I had shown during my undergraduate that if you could program a little bit, you looked real good. So I could get quite a lot done fairly quickly, or maybe not a lot, but it looked like a lot. Uh, and I mostly wanted to pursue my musical career. So I had an excuse to tell people what I was doing. Uh, so I kind of half-heartedly stayed. Uh, but then my music career didn't really work out. And so I finally got serious. Around the time that I was getting serious, um, a, an odd thing happened, which was that there was this old debate about our introns early or late. The hypothesis was uh, that introns actually were the glue that had stuck together the first genes, not just a while ago, but at the very start of life. And this was a very exciting idea for a lot of people, but it was a very frustrating debate uh, that I'm happy to talk about at another time. And so I think a lot of people just got tired of this debate. And so they just kind of dropped out and went to various other topics. Um, uh, leaving me at 25 as kind of the senior uh, active person in the field, almost. Uh, and this was at the time when the genomes were finally coming out. And so you really needed the genomes to understand anything about intron evolution. If you think about it, if you sequence, if you sequence an mRNA, you get a lot of information about, like, think about back, back, back before we things were ubiquitous. If you sequence a single RNA, you get a lot of information about amino acid usage. You get a lot of information about codon usage, uh, but you get zero information about introns because they're not in the mRNAs. And even if you sequence the DNA, you get like five or eight pieces of information about introns. Um, so we really needed the genomes and lo and behold, the genomes were just showing up as uh, everybody was leaving the field. So it's been odd since then. So I did a series of postdocs in non-intron labs, and then I did a contentious one with one lab that works on intron evolution, Eugene Kunins. Um, and then I've been a PI at San Francisco State since 2012. So today um, we're going to address four questions. Why are there spliceosomal introns? Why is there alternative splicing? Uh, why do different or organisms have some such different uh, numbers and densities of introns? And uh, why do different organisms have some such different spliceosomes? Okay, but before we get to why, we need to sort of, we need to know what. Uh, we need to know what the history is of the diversity that we see and of the phenomena. So uh, we're gonna start out with some background. Um, so the background today, we're gonna be talking only about spliceosomal introns. Bacterial non-spliceosomal introns are also very interesting, but not my topic today. So um, the these spliceosomal introns are removed by this remarkable complex process that I know quite a few of you in the department know a lot and have contributed to, uh, where you have this complex machinery that comes in and um, uh, enacts a complex uh, choreography to go from uh, this genomic structure to removing the intron. If time permits, we'll be also talking about the another separate spliceosome. So uh, it turns out that in animals and many other eukaryotes, uh, there are two separate spliceosomes tasked with removing different sets of introns. When you start to look at um, spliceosome, uh, at spliceosomal introns, you immediately notice some striking differences. So perhaps the two most famous genomes in terms of um, uh, splicing are our own humans and uh, S. cerevisiae, which has been the in, uh, uh, the absolutely necessary workhorse for this work. Okay, so um, 
you can see uh, most of the differences that we see uh, among eukaryotes you see between these organisms. So first is the difference in, in uh, intron density. Human genes have on average almost 10 introns per gene. Cerevisiae, uh, um, only 5% of Cerevisiae intro, uh, genes have an intron at all. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble talking. I have the uh, sort of famous uh, sleep deprivation that comes with uh, early parenthood. So I appreciate your um, forgiveness. I can't think of the word. <laughs> um, so the first one is uh, differences in numbers of introns. Uh, the second one is um, the sequences themselves. So you can see in Cerevisiae that there's these very strong motifs with about 75 to 80% of introns having the exact same extended five prime motif and the extended uh, branch point internal motif. Um, whereas when you look down at humans, um, you see that that's quite different with just basically TNA being the entire uh, consensus uh, for the branch point and a much reduced um, pattern of, at the five prime splicing. Um, the other thing you notice are differences in intron length, which we won't talk as much about today. Um, and finally, uh, differences between um, differences, uh, it, whereas the humans have the two separate splicesomes, the minor and the major, the U2 and the U12 sorry, the U12 and the U2 that we talked about, uh, Cerevisiae only has the one. Okay, so we see all these different differences. These are gonna be the first things we talk about today. Now, almost everybody's intuition is that evolutionary history went from something Cerevisiae-like to something human-like, right? We, we generally were drawn to this notion ever since Aristotle and the great chain of being that things progress from simple to complica complicated. However, we know that complexity does not always increase. So this is actually from uh, my intro bio class that I taught a few weeks ago. Um, we know that unicellular yeasts have evolved from multicellular fungi. Uh, we know that simple colonial tu tunicates have evolved from more complex, uh, detailed, almost vertebrate-like chordate uh, morphologies. We know that non-photosynthetic plants have, uh, have evolved by reduction from photosynthetic plants. We know that uh, Malaria parasites also were ancestrally um, photosynthetic and have lost that ability. Um, we know that uh, ax axolotl um, is actually just a transformed embryo or larva uh, that has lost its adult stage through simplification. And maybe one of the most striking cases are these things called mesozoans, um, which are descendant from triploblastic animals, but they have actually lost their different uh, cell layers and they are down to on average 14 cells. So we can't take it for granted that complexity increases. We need to look at the data. Okay, so a couple of slides to orient us here. Um, I, I'm guessing most of us are not accustomed to thinking about the diversity of eukaryotes. So let's just orient ourselves. Um, so here is the diversity of eukaryotes. Most of these lineages will be unfamiliar. Um, and I've just highlighted the, the lineages that we think about. So uh, all angiosperms, basically 90% of plants that you see, that is just this one branch in this huge sea of branches. Um, all the uh, all the fungi probably that people think about um, Neurospora, Palmi, Cerevisiae, Candida. That's all. They're all comprised in this one branch here. When you see Hitten uh, Madhani in two weeks, his organism is okay. It's one branch over. But this is all those fungi we think about are just this branch, and then this is all of animals, not just all of mammals, uh, not just all of bilaterian animals, but also sponges. So we're talking about a huge diversity here, and this is going to be um, our playing field today. A misapprehension that persists that I want to take some time to uh, try to help people uh, get rid of because it's been uh, debunked in the specialist literature and people may not know, is this idea of early branches. Okay, so the idea of early branches is that when we look across eukaryotes, that there are some eukaryotes that are primitive eukaryotes. That so, for instance, uh, diplomonads they lack a mitochondrion, um, and so there was this idea. Well, maybe they branched off from other eukaryotes before the mitochondrion was acquired. So they are, um, so that they are are primitive eukaryotes or in incomplete eukaryotes, sort of. And when we first started drawing evolutionary trees, um, the trees that we got actually ended up uh, supporting that. It, it looked like we had these early branches. This shows up a lot in molecular biology because people will um, use these as models. They'll say, oh, ciliates are early branching or giardia is early branching. So let's see what things were like before they got complicated. 
And so there was some really interesting work actually showing the, the rare introns that are present in some of these very interesting branches. For reasons that are very well understood by specialists, uh, but that I don't have time to get into right now, um, these trees were sort of systematically corrupted. They had artifactual problems that specifically took these weird branches and stuck them at the base of the tree. So on the left, we have a much more uh, modern tree. Um, and so I just like to point out on the right, we have the old tree and I've, I've color coded this to match with this. And what you can see is that these the branches that we now group together as greens are kind of scrambled all over the tree, that basically there's been a lot of rearrangement as our methods have gotten better. I'm going to guess that a lot of people don't care about the specifics of this, um, but what does this mean for our general picture of eukaryotic evolution? Well, notice before that we had this notion that we'd have an early branch that basically separated from all other uh, eukaryotes, that it was a distant relative. What does the tree look like now? Well, now the deepest branching within it, the deepest divide between eukaryotes, separates all these different lineages from all these different lineages. And if we look at the line what the lineages are, right, so it would be all of these, the ancestor of all these lineages diverge from the ancestor of all these lineages. And if we look at what the lineages are, well, plants are up here, fungi and animals are down here. So what that means immediately is anything or nearly anything that you observe in plants and in animals was there in the ancestors. An exception is multicellularity, but anything at the subcellular level. So do they, do they both have an endoplasmic reticulum? That means it was in the ancestor. Do they both have a mitochondrion? That means it was an ancestor. So we can knock off some very simple questions uh, about introns uh, uh, by using this tree. So first is the presence of, my, of uh, major spliceosomal introns, the major form. And you can see they're almost everywhere on the tree here. So that clearly indicates that they are ancestral to eukaryotes. What about minor spliceosomal introns? So uh, my collaborator, Tony Russell, um, uh, published this paper many years ago, showing basically that minor introns are also found on both halves of these tree strongly indicating that they were present already in the ancestor of all eukaryotes. Okay, so that's sort of the, the, the background here. We know that uh, introns and minor introns were already present in the ancestor of eukaryotes, and we need to um, now track their development since then. So we are going to now go, go through these different, um, these different differences that we were talking about one at a time and seeing what's the evidence that we have for them. Okay, so we can start um, with intron density. So what I've what I've done here on the tree is colored in red all those lineages where we have high intron densities, say more than one intron per gene, and in blue um, those that uh, that show lower intron densities, maybe more similar to yeast, one intron per several or many genes. And so what you can see it's a complex pattern. So there's been a lot of change to it. Um, so how do we distinguish? Does this mean there were there were few in the ancestor and they proliferated many times, or there were many in the ancestor and they've been they reduced? So here I've blown up the situation for fungi, and of course I promise that I haven't simplified this to further my own uh, argument. Um, and so what we see are all these different lineages. Here's Pombi, here's uh, Aspergillus and Neurospora, and in these these lineages we see pretty much all uh, lineages of fungi have at least one intron per gene, some far more than that. And the only exception is the clade that includes uh, S. cerevisiae. So this means that there are two of the simplest ways to explain this. One is we can say the ancestor was like cerevisiae, and then every single one of these lineages independently, because these are independent branches, independently gained a bunch of introns, or much more parsimoniously, much more simply, that the ancestor had many introns and it went down in cerevisiae. Okay, we can do better than that actually. If these lineages are intron rich because they've kept the old introns around, then the positions at which those introns interrupt protein coding genes should be conserved. And so this is one of the earliest papers on this. Uh, what we're looking at here is an alignment of uh, a, a set of orthologs um, from everything from malaria to Arabidopsis to uh, Pombi and Cerevisiae to humans and other models here. And what you see is this single intron position is shared across um, uh, most of these species, despite two, two billion years of evolution. And down here, we, we are looking at the pairwise. So this says basically how many intron are, are conserved, uh, pardon me, um, uh, 
without walking us through it, this basically shows that about half of, of the four or five introns per gene in Arabidopsis are shared with humans. The positions exa are, are exact. So when we look a little bit more closely, uh, we can see just how dramatic this is. So this is from uh, another one of the earliest studies that we did in 2003. Um, and we specifically, it should be said, we specifically went in trying to find new introns. So we weren't trying to find conservation. We wanted new introns so we'd know where they came from. So we looked at uh, some 1,000 genes, some 10,000 intron positions. And I'm showing you here three of the six um, most exciting ones that we found. So this gene, uh, this is basically saying that the intron position is shared between humans, mouse, and fish. This is shared between humans, mouse, and fish. This is humans, mouse, and fish. And you can see I'm not fudging things here. This is the exact position. Um, and so here's an exception. Uh, this is one of the six exceptions we found out of 10,000 lineages. And notice it's, pre it's absent in mouse, but it's present in humans. And it's also present in fish. So this is actually a loss in mouse. So this general intuition that we have that a lot of these introns are, are shared over long distances and that intron poor lineages have lost most of these ancestral introns is well borne out by these comparative studies. So here's the most recent of these by my, uh, uh, my student Brooke and her collaborator Lim. Um, this is a reconstruction across all of uh, all of fungi. Here's Cerevisiae in its group over here. Um, and generally what you see are, if you look into the deepest nodes of the tree, you find lots of red and yellow, which are higher intron densities. Uh, and, and so what we see is this general pattern that ancestral, intron, uh, ancestral genomes had more introns, um, certainly than Cerevisiae, but even than many modern species. And if you look at any uh, specific branch, so this is a tabulation across branches where we basically ask, is there more intron loss or is there more intron gain? And what you can see is that the left, it, it's absolutely dominated by the left-hand side here where most lineages are undergoing most more intron loss than gain. You do have exceptional lineages like the one here on the right uh, or the several here on the right where we have a massive proliferation of introns. Um, but overall, if you pick a lineage of eukaryotes, it's mostly going downhill in terms of intron number. Okay, so we can also take up this question of the strong boundaries that we see in, in Cerevisiae, where we have GT, AT, GT, and almost all introns versus the weaker ones we saw in humans. So again, um, we can sort of uh, uh, map here in red, the ones that have human-like weak boundaries, and in blue, the species that have uh, strong boundaries. And again, over here, we can blow up into the case in fungi. And what we see, is, once again, is it's this lineage, uh, just this lineage that Cerevisiae and its relatives that have strong boundaries. And actually, to the eagle-eyed, you will notice that this is the exact same figure that I used before, before because we see this remarkable and unexpected uh, striking correspondence between um, the, the strength of your boundary, information content being a jargony thing that just means how homogenous are your intron boundaries, and how many introns do you have? And so what we see is, uh, as we see here, where the same lineage that lost all its introns uh, got really strong boundaries, um, we, we see that across the whole tree of eukaryotes. We have yet to find an exception to this, quite, quite to our uh, delight and surprise. So what's going on with this? Um, so when we zoom in on the spliceosome, I'm actually going skip to skip the slide for the... Um, for in the interest of time. Um, when, we, when we zoom in on the spliceosome, what do we find? So this is a different perspective. Here we're looking at the machinery itself. And it's long been known that the set of the yeast uh, spliceosome is relatively, uh, is, is relatively small. It has relatively few components relative to the much more complex human spliceosome. What order does that go in? What direction does that go in? So what we're seeing here, um, this is work by Brad uh, working with Hitton's lab. Um, so here, this is the number of spliceosomal co components among known spliceosomal components um, that are found to be present in these lineages. And so what you see, again, the same exact lineage of organisms has greatly reduced um, its spliceosome. We see complex spliceosomes across fungi, uh, and only in the lineage, including Cerevisiae, do we see the simplification. And we see that pattern as well when we look at uh, various individual factors where all these splice, all these Components have been lost in Cerevisiae, but are mostly maintained in all the fungi that we look at. 
Okay, so quite opposite our intuition, we see this pattern where we have good evidence in all these things that the ancestral uh, that the ancestor of eukaryotes had minor introns, had higher intron numbers, had uh, had more diverse splicing signals, um, and had a more complex spliceosome, and that it's been a pattern, a recurrent pattern of simplification of all these things leading to various lineages. Okay, so now we can get into our questions um, of of whys. So let's just orient you here. I'm going to use this slide. This is a summary slide of basically everything we know about spliceosomal uh, spliceosomality across eukaryotes. So each one of these are the major groups of uh, eukaryotes. So here's land plants, um, here's fungi, and here's ourselves. Here's animals. Um, and I've marked uh, several things here. Uh, whether there are few or many introns, again, sort of just much uh, around making the cutoff around one um, with few being a lot less than one and many being at least one intron per gene. And I've marked uh, which lineage is a multicellular versus unicellular. Um, and I've, I've highlighted where we see um, the most interesting form of alternative splicing. Okay. Um, and so to, to read this, this means basically if I say that that holozoans um, are, are dark black. That means most holozoans um, have many introns, but then I've highlighted instances in which we have uh, uh, reduction. And if I do XXX, that means there's multiple lineages where we see them. Okay, so now we can uh, tackle some questions. Um, and first we can kind of eliminate some, uh, some popular ideas. Okay, so why are there spliceosomal introns? Now, before I go forward here, I wanna say, there are very good reasons to know that that individual introns have importance. Um, these have been worked out. If you the, if if there's alternative splicing near an intron, obviously you need that intron for a modern human. That that in this species we need this particular intron. But that can only account for a very small fraction of introns. We only have functional good reasons to understand to 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 infer the function of introns for a tiny tiny fraction of introns in any genome. So here I'm not saying. Uh, I'm not searching an a uh, hundred uh, percent. I'm not. I'm not searching for an answer that can explain a hundred percent of the pattern. But I am searching for an explanation that can explain ninety percent of the pattern. Why are there so many, uh, oh, so many introns in humans and so few in yeast, in the global scale? Okay. So one common hypothesis is introns are there to facilitate alternative splicing. Um, so this does not work because sort of. The, the productive form of alternative splicing where, you, where a gene is spliced multiple ways to give rise to multiple proteins is really only observed at any frequency whatsoever um, in this lineage of animals, not even all animals, uh, and maybe secondarily in land plants. And as we've said, there are many, many lineages uh, here in black that have many introns and yet do not have this. So it is, uh, it is logically inconsistent to say that introns arose to facilitate alternative splicing. Introns cannot have arisen two billion years ago so that they'd be around a billion years later. That's not how natural selection works. If they were not doing anything two billion years ago, then natural selection would not have kept them around for an extra billion years. So this hypothesis does not work. Similarly, with multicellularity, um, we see that there are many different multicellular lineages um, in red uh, here that um, that have not evolved alternative splicing. And moreover, that within uh, fungi, uh, sorry, within animals, that multiple lineages uh, that are uh, of multicellular animal also do not have much productive alternative splicing. Uh, or, and also that they don't have introns. Again, that we have uh, all these different lineages that are unicellular, um, that have many introns, uh, and yet, uh, so that we don't, don't see a, clear correspondence between multicellularity and intron number. Another hypothesis is a little bit further inside baseball that you'd hear from splicing people, um, which is the notion that splicing is such a complex pro process and so interdependent that you can't lose an intron because it would screw up splicing of uh, the neighboring introns. However, that really doesn't is not expected to, to work uh, in, in most species because most species seem to have more isolated splicing. That is, that this idea of uh, interdependence between introns is, is kind of focused on animals and not seen elsewhere. And then there are just the lineages where you have lost large fractions of ancestral introns, um, suggesting that this is not a force that's sufficient to keep introns from being lost. 
Another hypothesis would be of the form, well, it's good to have introns around. Um, and so uh, maybe they allow for spacing out of, of functional sequence in general. Maybe they allow for avoidance of R loops. And while that could help to, that, that's sort of a good reason to keep introns in general around, the way that natural selection works is that an individual change occurs. For our purposes, that could mean that would mean that an intron, imagine an, an individual intron is lost. And the question is, is natural selection going to be like, no, 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 I need that intron. You can't, you can't, you can't get rid of that. Or is natural selection going to say, okay, who cares? So it's hard for me to imagine. So this, this general hypothesis, it's good to have some introns. Does a really poor job of explaining why you can't lose the 200,000th intron, right? I, I said that there's basically in humans and mouse, there's almost no change, no gain or loss over 80 million years. It's hard for me to imagine that every single one of those 200,000 introns is of importance, um, particularly given that these exact same introns have been lost in another lineage of cordials. Okay, so, so what is going on here in general? So uh, this is what I call the farm box cabbage hypothesis. Uh, at the time I was living in a, uh, I was living in an apartment and we got a farm box of, of food and it would have cabbage every week. Um, and then every week their cabbage would show up and then nobody would eat the cabbage. So why is there so much cabbage in the fridge? Basically because cabbage is delivered and then it never goes away. So why are there introns? Well, introns can be created and we'll talk in a moment about the mechanism, um, but they were not deleted. Okay, why would they not be deleted? Um, my hypothesis for that would be uh, as follows. This is sort of unfamiliar to us. We generally think that mutations that 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 mutation will provide, right? If we're looking for a change, a small change in a protein coding sequence, we kind of imagine that 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 change will occur. Something like changing a C into a T. That's common. That's just a mistake, right? If, if, if when the when the uh, replication machinery is copying things, if it makes a mistake, uh, then we'll go from a C to a T. But let's think about introns. With introns, it's very different. For that to occur, it would, you have to have some deletion that precisely deletes GT and then say 2000 nucleotides in AG and precisely gives you back the form without the intron. So I would propose that what's going on here is just like introns are, intron loss is a hard thing to have happen. And so we can see this sort of updates the human mouse data I was talking about. This is looking at 40,000 intron positions over 400 million years in everything from sharks to mice. And you can see this is how many intron losses we see. Very, very few. And yet, if you go out one more branch to Oikopleura, which is a, another chordate, you see that they've lost 95% of these introns. So my hypothesis is that why are there still introns around? They're possible to gain, but they're hard to lose. OK, what about why is there alternative splicing? So we can similarly knock down some some uh, kind of identical hypotheses here. I actually misspoke before and gave you this answer um, in the same way. So maybe it's multicellularity. And yet, when you look across the eukaryotic tree, you see many lineages that are multicellular um, and have uh, little or no productive alternative splicing. Similarly, with organismal complexity, um, you know, we see within animals uh, that um, there are some pretty simple uh, bilaterian animals that still have alternative splicing, and conversely, some complex other lineages that don't. So it just doesn't it doesn't explain much about the data. Another possibility is well, maybe there are maybe to have alternative splicing, you have to have a lot of introns. But I'll just remind you, most eukaryotes have a lot of introns, and so should so that this can explain why only one one lineage evolved alternative splicing. So he, he, this kind of blows up. Uh, in on this. So this is the lineage. So here, here is us. Here's here's uh, bilaterian animals. Um, here's uh, Nidaria, which is uh, anemones and corals and things like that. So this is basically the, this is the group where you see a lot of alternative splicing. These are the intron densities. So we see no evidence for an uptick in, in introns per gene at the time that alternative splicing evolves. And in fact, things have kind of gone downhill in many different lineages. So there's no evidence locally or globally, um, locally within animals or globally across eukaryotes, uh, that the evolution of alternative splicing is closely associated with the number of introns. 
another possibility would be, well, it's only when your exons are short and there I'll just point you out that, that if you have a lot of introns, you already have short exons. So that's just a miss. Uh, so if you have a lot of introns, then we already have short intron exons. Um, so that can't be an explanation at all e uh, either. One more that's easy to knock down. So people would say, well, when you have this kind of diversity of boundaries, that allows for the splice zone to kind of pick and choose how it's going to splice, and that facilitates alternative splicing. But again, both globally across eukaryotes, most lineages have very diverse so-called weak boundaries. And even if we look within the group that give rise to animals, um, you see that many different lineages already have these weak boundaries, and yet we only see the rise of alternative splicing here. I don't, squinting at this, I don't see any difference in the diversity of splice sites here where there is alternative splicing versus above. So what do I think is going on? Okay, so central to this notion of, uh, uh, central to productive alternative splicing is one form of alternative splicing, which is exon skipping. And, and so that would be shown here where you can either make just blue, blue, or you can make blue, green, blue, including this other exon. Given modularity of proteins, this turns out to be a really good way to include a, a module of protein uh, in the middle and, and, and gives for the, the possibility of sort of uh, using the middle of the intron as a laboratory for finding new um, exons. Exon skipping, um, that form we were just talking about, is associated with a certain form of splicing called exon definition. This gets a little jargony, but basically, um, there are two ways of splicing. Either you can find a five prime and three prime match and, and splice together the exons, or you can kind of assemble a splice zone branched across an exon. So under those circumstances, you basically assemble a splice zone here, a splice zone here, and a splice zone there. And then the, then the splice zones talk to each other to splice out the introns. Exon skipping is closely associated with this de exon definition model. So maybe the answer to when how we get effective uh, alternative splicing is how we get exon skipping, which is how we get exon definition. And exon definition is closely associated with long introns. So that would suggest maybe what happened is we had a lineage with long introns that evolved exon definition that therefore uh, had exon skipping. Oh, sorry, that should say alternative splicing. What does the data say? So again, blowing us up on that on that group. Um, this is showing the uh, the intron lengths. So these these question marks basically it's it's hugely variable, uh, but generally long. So this is this is the median intron length and the ninety percent and the ten percent. So in humans, this is about two uh, this is about two kilobases, and this is uh, many kilobases. Um, and so what we see is that it isn't exactly the lineage that evolved alternative splicing that we see the intron lengths blowing up. This one hundred forty three is no longer than cerevisiae. And sponges, it's actually even shorter. And so I propose that what happened is there was a spread of transposable elements uh, in this ancestor that increased the size of the genome, including increased uh, the size of the introns. This led to exon definition, uh, which allowed, allowed to, uh, uh, which um, exon definition, which allowed for exon skipping to give us this classic animal-like alternative splicing. Okay, so moving on to our third question, why do different organisms have such different intron numbers or densities? Okay, so there are a bunch of ideas that have been put forward um, and they sort of fall to the same distribution that we see. Uh, multicellularity does not correlate, alternative splicing does not correlate, organismal complexity does not correlate, um, difference in selection against um, introns, um, so this predicts, so basically if there were some, there's this popular idea that some lineages, there's strong selection against extra uh, extra DNA, like introns, uh, in other lineages, maybe like ourselves, there's little or no selection against it. If that was the case, then we would expect that if we look at intron loss and gain rates across a lineage, that those lineages that gain a lot of introns, so must not have strong selection, would lose few introns. And those that lose a lot of their introns, if that's because of selection, they would also not be gaining introns. But we do not see this correlation when we look across things. Those lineage, in fact, those lineages that have gained the most introns seemed also to have lost the most introns. It seems more that it's it's some sort of a a, a general overall rate that you either have fast lineages where there's lots of change and slow lineages where there's very little change. 
Uh, this is a popular idea that I'm going to skip over. Um, and so if anybody wants to talk to me about effective population size, I'm happy to, but um, uh, again, we see no evidence for it. Okay, so then we are back to our cabbage model where what's going to matter for how many introns you have is going to be the balance between two things. How frequently do you gain new introns and how frequently do you get rid of them? So let's break those in half. We can start with intron loss. Um, and so we do see some correlates of intron loss. We see lineages uh, with short introns seem to uh, lose more, um, to lose introns more readily. And the idea there could be that it just, um, to, to get the mutation, perhaps through recombination with a cDNA, uh, that it would be easier if you have a shorter intron to loop out. We see lineages, as I said, with generally fast evolution. So Oikopleura, which is a chordate, it's lost 95% of its introns, and then it's just transformed in all these other ways. It's lost its Hox, Hox cluster, um, it uh, has lost a lot of genes, it's gained a lot of new genes, and there's huge developmental differences. One possible explanation for this, this sort of general rate thing is maybe it's generation time. So the generation for chordate, this is a remarkably short generation time in Oikopleura, half a month. And so the idea is there's just more generations per year, per million years, which could lead to more general mutation and therefore more general change. Okay, what about uh, rates of intron gain? So um, what I'm showing here is basically if we are going to get to five or 10 introns per gene in 2 billion years, then we need uh, at least 2.5 intron gains per billion years on average. Um, to get to our modern densities, even if we don't account for intron loss. So 2 billion years of eukaryotic evolution, we need to be gaining things at least this fast. This comes from many, at this point, sort of old studies um, looking at intron gain rates. And what you see is there are no lineages where the intron gain rate is anywhere near what it needs to be to explain modern densities. And the one exception is stickleback, and that one's wrong. And I can tell you it's wrong because it's my work and I made a mistake. So we had been looking, and I told you about these early studies where we were looking for intron gains and we found nothing. But then a huge breakthrough came in 2009, which was found by a fluke, um, where they were looking in this green alga that they sequenced because of interest in its primary ocean, its primary production in the ocean. And what they found in capital letters here was that many, many, many of the introns, thousands of the introns in the genome had nearly identical sequences, um, which is clearly uh, indicative of a mobile element of a transposable element. We didn't know what kind of transposable element they were, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to skip over this bit. Um, I will summarize that by saying we see clear signatures that those mo mobile elements are DNA transposable elements um, that have kind of class classic cut and paste signatures. Okay, so, so now we know there are lineages where intron uh, gain rates are much higher um, uh, and uh, due to these spreading transposable elements, but we didn't know generally. So along with Landon Gozashi, when he was an undergraduate, uh, we searched uh, 1,700 species for which there were genomes in NCBI looking for these transposable element, uh, these intron creating transposable elements, which are called introns. We found only 48 lineages representing only eight groups of, of organisms within 1,700 species. Um, but then I was talking to uh, my former student, Jared Olison, and he said, oh, there's this new correct collection of genomes that they sequenced out of the ocean. You should have a look at those. And we had noticed within these eight lineages that they were mostly algae. We didn't know what to make of that. So then we, we searched for 520 species um, and we found 25 additional groups. So overall, aquatic species, basically anything that's in the ocean, 17% of them, have active transposable elements that are creating introns, whereas only two, that's the case for only 2%, 2.6% uh, of non-aquatic species. This was completely unexpected. The first insight that anyone's actually ever had into uh, why do some lineages gain introns and others do not. And so this sort of summarizes what we were seeing here. This has just come out in PNAS. Um, and what we see is lots of differences in the numbers of introners, numbers of different families of introners, um, and here we found evidence that introners tend to insert between 
nucleosomes, which is consistent with them probably all being DNA transposable elements. If we look at different elements, we find entirely different sequences. So this appears to be independent evolution of transposable elements that evolve the ability to create introns and then spread. So what we think is going on here, so then the question becomes why um, marine organisms? So evidence is accumulating that uh, marine organisms are more likely to acquire DNA from the environment, perhaps because uh, DNA is more stable in aquatic environments, perhaps, be, uh, perhaps for other reasons. We don't know. All we know is phenomenologically that marine organisms seem to acquire more uh, DNA in general. So one possibility is that the marine life cycle leads to greater accumulation or greater um, acceptance of transposable elements from the environment, and therefore a higher um, chance that you acquire one of these intron creating elements. Okay, and so uh, I've just got one more thing to share here, um, which should be, uh, be brief, and then we can move on to questions. Um, okay, so as we've talked about, we see this pattern where we have some lineages that have simplified um, their spliceosomes. This is from a different study by Brad ba Bowser and myself, where we have this lineage that has reduced its um, the complexity of its spliceosome. So here's the ancestral like folks, and then like Cerevisiae, it is reduced. And we've said that this is associated with intron number reduction. So there are basically two models for why this happens. One is splices almost simplification happens first, and that increases pressure to lose suboptimal introns. That basically, if you have a, cer a, a cerevisiae like spliceosome that will only splice um, the perfect intron with the GT, AT, GT, and a perfect branch point, then there's going to be selection to lose the other introns. The other possibility is that it's something more complex. So perhaps massive intron loss leads to differences in trade offs between inefficient splicing and cryptic splicing. The spliceosome, like all of us, have to balance between, has to balance between uh, false positives, finding, uh, uh, splicing things that aren't introns, and false negatives, failing to splice introns. And this trade-off is going to shift depending on how many targets you have. So this model would say, maybe you have just massive intron loss for the reasons we've been discussing, and that changes the selection on the spliceosome, and so that the spliceosome uh, becomes more strict. So how can we test this? So we looked, um, basically what had been needed was a lineage where there was ongoing, where there was simplified spliceosome and strong boundaries, but ongoing intron loss. And so without getting into the details here, you can see the p-values. We basically asked, um, is there any evidence that introns without sub with, with suboptimal splice sites are lost, preferentially with sub suboptimal branch points, or with suboptimal lengths. And we see no evidence in any of these instances uh, for, for preferential loss of introns. So this is not consistent with the notion that the spliceosome changes and then you lose your introns. And so we have our, our fourth answer, um, why do different introns have such different spliceosomes? It seems to be coevolution of introns and spliceosome after massive intron loss. Um, I am short on time, so I'm not gonna have uh, time to tell you about the bonus question. Uh, which is why there are minor uh, or U12 introns. There's a paper up on BioArchive um, that I think is very compelling um, and, and suggests that many of the things we've thought we've known um, that are, are actually artifacts are or actually do not hold generally about minor introns. And so we conclude, um, somewhat to our surprise, that minor introns seem to mostly be evolving neutrally, that basically they are not being retained in the genome, nor are they being purged from the genome. They're kind of just drifting along through evolution. Okay, so here are our conclusions. Um, I've argued that uh, spliceosomal introns is just the cabbage box, uh, the farm box cabbage uh, model, that there are mechanisms that create them, and there are a few mechanisms that get rid of them, and so they stick around. I've argued that alternative splicing uh, arose in response to uh, intron expansion rather than for any of these other reasons, specifically in one lineage of animals. Um, I've argued that differences in, uh, or in organism intron densities um, come uh, from sort of fast evolving species generally losing more introns uh, versus uh, some lineages that undergo more lateral gene transfer, lateral transposable element transfer, gaining more introns. I've argued that uh, organisms that have different spliceosomes, that what we're seeing there is not difference in, in, in selection, 
on introns, but rather that intron loss precedes the other changes. And finally, um, I have waved my hands at this question of why are there splices, uh, minor introns, that they are neither particularly important generally, nor are they particularly costly, uh, but it's mostly uh, neutral processes. So I thank everybody for their attention. I look forward to some questions. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Scott. That was a, a really fascinating talk. Um, so I mentioned the best way to, to ask questions. I think maybe, um, I would say just feel free to speak up. <laughs> that might be the, the easiest thing to do. Maybe maybe I can go first. I, I was curious just on the if you can speculate any on the time scales of these processes. So you say introns are easier to gain and harder to lose. You know, how you know, so so for the the human lineage where we had we have a lot of introns. Oh, I guess maybe that's neutral, but I guess when we gained, what was the time scale of that versus the time scale of like Cerevisiae losing all Great. of that? Yeah, so um, I'm trying to find the, the slide. Um, it, the, the, the history of humans is almost unbelievable. Within 500 million years, there's no evidence of human, of the lineage leading to humans having gained any introns, maybe 1% of our introns. Um, so, so let me say, I'm here talking about within conserved regions, all kinds of cool stuff happens, like where you already, where you like add sequence by totally re renovating your genome. And that's all very interesting, but I'm talking here about if we look at ribosomal protein coding genes, if we look at conserved genes, um, have they acquired new introns? And, and it's an almost unbelievable result that within at least 500 million years of evolution, there's basically no gain. What's the situation with, uh, Cerevisiae? So with Cerevisiae, um, not sure if I can get to the slide. If you look in on, on uh, Brooke and Lim's paper, um, so here's the one I was looking for before. So here we're again looking in 40,000 intron positions, so about 4,000 genes. Um, and you can see in elephant shark in 500 million years, we reconstruct a total of nine gains. In humans, we reconstruct a total of 13 gains. So what's the time scale for Cerevisiae? Here we go. So in, in Cerevisiae, it seems to be uh, kind of a stepwise process. So here is Cerevisiae over here. And so this is the intron density per gene. So here we are with Cerevisiae at, at really basically zero. Um, uh, and so you can see there's a kind of a stepwise process. The, the ancestor of Ascomycetes, so that would be like with Pombi and with um, Aspergillus, uh, has far more introns per gene. And then we see step down to basically the ancestor of the yeast group goes down to about two. And then the ancestor of most of the yeast group again goes down by about fivefold. And then you have gradual reduction here. Um, and so this time scale, it's very hard with fungi because they don't have um, a fossil record because like they don't fossilize. Uh, but we're talking about several hundred millions of years here from the time that the Cerevisiae ancestor had four introns per gene to the modern. So it's not a single, it's not a single event. We have evidence that it's a kind of ongoing process that for whatever reason that this lineage has generally higher rates of loss. Very cool. So I think Dave Brow has a question. Hi, yes. Um, great talk, Scott. Uh, Thanks. There had been an uh, idea for a long time about the loss of introns in cerevisiae being due to reverse transcription and cDNA recombination. And that was based on um, the fact that there was a five prime um, bias towards the position of intron. So it takes mm -hmm. longer to reverse transcribe an mRNA or it's harder to reverse, uh, reverse transcribe an mRNA. So the, my question for you is where you see intron loss, does it seem to follow that same pattern that was identified in cerevisiae? So I would say that, yeah, so in in general, so, so there are some exceptions, but uh, for the most part, if you pick a random species and you say, is there a signature of more loss of three prime introns? There is. Mm -hmm. At the same yeah. time, I would say, ironically, given that Cerevisiae is what highlighted it for us, that in Cerevisiae, the, 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 that may not actually be what's going on. The introns that are conserved are highly biased towards ribosomal protein coding genes. Um, and that's actually not, so, so the model that basically three prime introns um, are, are under more danger of loss because there's more cDNA copies. 
That same model would make the prediction that highly expressed genes should lose their introns more often because there are more mRNA copies from which to make cDNA copies. So, and I and and I, I'm not saying I figured this out. I did not. I, I agreed with the with with the consensus, but it wasn't it wasn't um, coherent or at least complete to start out with, right? And so it seems that ribosomal protein coding genes in, in many different of these lineages. So here we have multiple different lineages where nearly all introns are lost independently. Those ribosomal protein coding genes stick around for reasons that are in part known. They have they play regulatory functions um, in various ways. And so it may not it, like in in in, in um, one of the ribosomal protein coding genes in Cerevisiae. There's this cool thing where there's basically a protein that binds right near the splice site. Okay, so it goes ATG, and then there's the intron. That's actually very common in ribosomal protein coding genes. It's the ATG start codon, and then the intron. What that means is you can have a protein, um, often the encoded protein, that binds to that region and both blocks splicing and blocks translation. Um, and so that seems, I, I think if you take away the ATG intron, introns in the ribosomal protein coding genes, that, that the signal becomes almost impossible to detect. So the answer is yes and no. The answer is that was right and it was wrong. That that old idea, I think. Thanks, uh, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for a really interesting talk, Scott. Um, so I think your previous answer might have hinted at this, but in thinking at losing, so many species have lost so many introns. Um, is it surprising that the introns? are always lost, I guess, exactly from the beginning to the end of the intron. Like they don't take any extra codons with them on either end. Is there something right. mechanistic about that? You're exactly right that the answer is exactly what we were just discussing. So um, the fact that in general, you see uh, preferential, uh, preferential loss from highly expressed genes, generally, from uh, three prime ends and exact loss is all consistent with uh, introns being lost by recombination with cDNAs. Um, and so uh, you you do, everything happens in evolution. And, you know, we do these screens to basically find every in interesting thing. There are instances in which introns are partially lost or more than an intron is lost. Um, but, uh, and interestingly, in one of the classic cases where you see partial intron loss, then uh, it, it turns out that it's the change in the protein that was selected to sort of push that into the that it basically changes the protein in an advantageous way. So, but for the ma vast majority of, of differences that you see, they are exact, consistent with recombination with cDNAs. Great, thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, Chris? Yeah, thanks, uh, Aaron. Uh, really interesting, thought-provoking talk, talk, Scott. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Um, so I, I'm going to take the bait on the uh, population size argument and see if I can get you to explain Bound or expand a little bit on that. Certainly, that's an argument that Mike Lynch has right. made reasonably convincingly. And, and maybe related to that, there was also a paper that Mike Lynch had in science, I think about a decade ago, where they looked at uh, DAP, new introns in Daphnia. Mm -hmm. um, and or, or maybe it was lost in trans, but the, but the argument was based on sort of the allele frequency spectrum. And the argument was that they could see. Uh, based on these introns that were variable in the population or, or recently gained or recently lost, um, that it was consistent with them being uh, slightly deleterious in, in an organism like Daphnia that would have a population size big enough, presumably, to select against introns if if they wanted. So, yeah, so um, kind of a long question, but uh, <laughs> so the data in that paper is super exciting. Um, the interpretation that it has anything to do with effective population size, it's it's n of one. There's no nothing comparative there. Um, I, I guess I will allow myself to say it the following way. If I were from a famously uh, small effective population size lineage, like vertebrates, like mammals, and it were the case that multiple different labs, not just Scott Roy, but other labs that have worked on it, have shown zero intron losses within this, uh, sorry, zero intron gains within 500 million years of evolution, uh, where we expect effective population size by Mike's arguments, to have been very low for all the time, um, I would at least have interfaced with that uh, datum within the 20 years after it was published. Um, so, so there's, there's no, yeah, you know, it's sort of gain, right? 
I'm sorry, please. That's an argument uh, for uh, against a role in population size for gain, but maybe not for loss. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it, it is not an argument against um, uh, effective population size for loss. Um, so, so I, I would say that, uh, the, the, so the fact that you see correlation between loss and gain, um, that certain lineages, the lineages that gain more introns tend to lose, also lose more introns, that is not consistent with the effective population size model, right? Because, because basically if you're, if you're talking about a, a barometer where there's more selection, the same selection that allows intron gains should also be driving out introns. It should, it should be driving intron losses. So, so there should be an inverse, a very clear and actually a very striking inverse correlation is predicted. Instead, you see a positive correlation. So that's another instance in which it can't, uh, it can't explain the data. Um, there are various errors made uh, logically in the, so for instance, Mike predicts in the intron paper that uh, intron, that phase zero introns, um, the ones that don't interrupt codons, um, should, could be more common because when you get an intron sliding event uh, where basically you eat some of the intron and make it coding sequence that the fact that you're not creating a new codon um, uh, would mean that it's not as costly that would be surprising to me that when you gain a bunch of codons that the one that you would change uh, would be the most important one but logically that predicts that phase zero introns should be most common phase two introns because this kind of a sliding event would basically be a, a third position change which is often synonymous that phase two introns should be second most common and phase one introns should be least common. That's never been observed. Um, uh, it's also, I think, a little bit credulous to say that um, that these sliding events, which have basically never been observed, are going to be the thing that are dominating the selection on things. So I think there's a little fishing for um, a little fishing in there. Um, but at the end of the day, I would say that basically uh, I'm not aware of a single fulfilled prediction of the hypothesis. Um, that is to say something that came after the preliminary, right? There's this sort of like organisms that we think are simple, uh, have simpler genomes, organisms that we think are complex, have more complex genomes. That's sort of, that was the starting point. Um, and so now there's been 20 years for there to be a fulfilled prediction and I'm not aware of one. I know that I, I know that I'm being uh, difficult here and I, but, but that's, I'm just being honest about my actual assessment of the data. I thought that was very diplomatic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, so maybe our, our final uh, question, uh, Christopher. Hey, um, thanks. You have a very fun research topic. I wanted to ask I think so. about. <laughs> I wanted to ask if you'd <clears throat> done any um, work looking at non-spliceosomal introns, and you mentioned that early on. No. no okay. Um, uh, I, I think they're cool, but I haven't done any work on them. So second part of your question. <laughs> well, the second part was a little bit related because you mentioned how when you said um, you're kind of getting into the field at a point when people were hypothesizing that um, introns may have been uh, critical very early on in stitching genes together. And I was just curious what that hypothesis kind of was and what research had been Great. So I brought one extra slide, and that's it. Um, so the the notion was um, right. So so now people are much more sanguine about the notion that. Uh, sorry. So so there's a general like once once life gets started, then Darwinian natural selection processes can work in. Once you have a protein, now you can modify it. But the question is, how do you get your first functional protein? It was seen as a contradiction that basically that that random sequence would not assemble into any sort of a scaffold that would allow for the first uh, protein function after which natural selection could do its work. So the question was, how can we get our first full length protein? Um, and uh, now I think people think that that random protein sequences will fold of certain sorts will fold up uh, sufficiently to give you a back backbone. But then it was seen as a as a as a real mystery. And so Wally and Ford Doolittle proposed, well, maybe what happened is you had small exon sized proteins that basically evolved a, a, a simple function, and then they could modularly be assembled um, through recombination within introns. That basically, if I have two modular genes and they don't have an intron, then to get them together, I need a very precise, weird recombination event. But if they're flanked by introns, then I can have a recombination anywhere in the intron, and now they'll get stuck together. So, um, this is kind of the 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 history of that. So that was the the theory, 
and through the 90s, there were these these regularities, um, including uh, of codon positions uh, that we were talking about um, and correlations that myself and others, I was quite junior at the time, but um, I, sh I should say that I did stump for these uh, ideas, um, uh, that it seemed that they were consistent. Basically, you'd come up with this predict, but you'd come up with a prediction, oh, if, if Wally and Ford are right, then uh, we would expect this commonality or this correlation, and we do see the correlation. Um, and, and, and what became frustrating about the debate is the people on the intron's early side, which was also me, um, would say, uh, would say like, we have this, this small correlation. Isn't it amazing that after 4 billion years of evolution, we can still see the correlation? And people on the other side would say, that's a small correlation. Genomes are complicated. You're going to see stuff. So I would say in my, my summary here, that since 2000, um, I don't, nobody who's working on the question anymore really believes in introns early. Um, some folks that have left the field, I think still, still do. Uh, but basically now that we have sampled this huge diversity of prokaryotes and we see nothing splicesome like, and now in fact, we can see, uh, we don't see intro, high intron densities or anything like a spliceosome. Um, and now that we know that actually eukaryotes are just one lineage of specialized archaea, this would require, if there was anything eukaryote-like in the ancestor, it would require its, its wholesale loss uh, without a trace many, many times. Um, and so in addition, during that same time, it's been reconstructed, as I kind of alluded to, that a whole bunch of other stuff happened in the ancestor of eukaryotes. That's when the mitochondrion showed up. It's when the ER showed up. It's when the nucleus showed up and so forth. So it's sort of guilt by association. It just seems uh, in all these things, including the conversation we were just having about effective population size, it's sort of a weird way of doing science because you don't have the data. You can't take it in the lab and do the experiment you want. So it really gets more to a sort of preponderance of the evidence. Um, and as I said, uh, as I said about the hypothesis we were discussing, that basically I don't know of any fulfilled predictions. Sort of similarly, you know, uh, uh, bold claims require bold evidence or whatever that is. Um, and here it's just there's not enough clear evidence to, to, to sustain that anymore, in my and I think most people's uh, opinion. Thanks for the history. You bet. So let's all uh, thank Scott for the wonderful uh, seminar, and uh, he'll stay uh, with the students after this. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Take care. So the students, please uh, stay in this. And thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Thanks for saying, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate the invite. So I have a question. Please. I was wondering, uh, maybe you mentioned in your talk, but why exactly do, why exactly would introns arise? Like, it seems like something, like something just randomly inserting introns into a gene would be bad for the organism. So like, why is this, why is this evolutionary viable? Like why, why, how does this even benefit the organism? So I would guess that it does not benefit the organism. You know, our, our genomes are 46% made up of value elements, right, or of, of transposable elements in general. Uh, though we now know some really exciting instances in which transposable element insertions, uh, transposable element insertions have contributed to uh, genome function. Um, in my reading of the literature, there's still no reason to think that any more than a small fraction of transposable insertions, um, uh, transposable element insertions are, are uh, useful that instead it still is very much that they're selfish or maybe neutral. Um, and I would say that the same thing uh, would likely be the case for transposable elements um, that are spreading uh, and creating introns, these intron uh, elements. Um, the, the, it's hard to get, so we wanted to do this stuff, uh, the, the, the way that one can test fitness. Okay, so you can test the fitness of fitness by sort of, you can take it into the lab and do a direct head-to-head -head competition between two things. Although it can, you, that, that requires fairly strong selection, even weak selection can be important. 
generally the way that that people look at these things like for a certain class of mutations are they good or bad is to look at the diversity within a within a species um, to basically compare um, what Chris mentioned before the the site frequency spectrum um, we wanted to do that 20 years ago but we only got the data like six months ago because we've been looking for lineages that had ongoing intron gain and we've had so few known lineages um, so we haven't been able to do the test precisely the best evidence that we have is that in, uh, new introns seem to pr uh, insert preferentially into lowly expressed genes. So we can imagine that the costs to, uh, in terms of uh, of misspliced transcripts or in, in terms of just extra transcription of the intronic sequences that, that insert, that these costs would be higher for highly expressed genes. And consistent with that, we see more uh, frequent insertion into lowly expressed genes. So that suggests they are a little bit costly. But um, um, another piece of evidence that's important is that in these introns, these newly inserted introns seem to be spliced extremely efficiently, uh, efficiently which is interesting. Um, they're actually more efficiently spliced. You see fewer splicing errors than for ancient introns. I mean, you could argue that either way. You could say that's remarkable that these newly inserted introns, even though they haven't had time to co-evolve with the sequence they're inserted to, still have these really, uh, still are very easy to recognize by the splices of. Um, it's surprising that the ones that have had millions of years to evolve didn't get better at it. On the other hand, these transposable elements that are spreading through the genome, creating introns, are still under selection to have figured out the optimal sequence to be spliced. Whatever the case may be, the fact that they are very efficiently spliced suggests that the um, that the specific splicing costs, the fact that they're introns, not the extra DNA, but the sort of extra RNA, uh, may not be a large cost. If that's so, then that could argue that the the costs to insertion um, are sorry, the costs to splicing are minimal, and then the costs to the extra DNA would just be like any tr other transposable element. So I can't give you a good answer, but I can say whatever it is that allows for the uh, for the existence of transposable elements should equally well apply to introns that are propagating as uh, transposable elements. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Myron? Hey, um, so I'm I, I'm interested when you were talking about the introners, um, and this is in the paper that you sent to, that it's the, the bias towards aquatic uh, lineages. Uh, you, you were saying that you would potentially something relating to them uh, more often taking in uh, just like transposable elements in general or something. Uh, do you DNA have, in general, yeah, that's right. DNA in general, yeah. Is is there, is that like a known thing? Is there, is there like a, a reason why that might be? And then also how like, does that also um, uh, gel with the, because you saw it in, in fungi as well, right? Yes. Um, is that also the case in fungi? Uh, so, uh, the, the, the answer is, um, it looks promising, uh, but I, I would be lying to assert that we, that it, that we have the whole story wrapped up. We do not, um, I do not, I'm not aware of any, uh, direct comparisons of propensity to acquire genes from the environment across eukaryotic lineages. So, so nobody's done, you know, you want to be able to say, look here, there is direct evidence that, that these lineages, specifically those that we see acquiring, um, intron elements acquire more stuff in general. However, I don't know that anybody's done that. It is the case that if you that that the lineages where where there seem to be the most um, uh, stories about lateral acquisition of genes are green are are a variety of uh, marine organisms uh, and um, Pazizomycetina fungi, specifically those where we see it gaining it. Uh, um, but so it's not quantified, but my reading of the literature, if I look for a lateral gene transfer story, um, they seem to be concentrated in those lineages. So it's all consistent. Mm -hmm. So as I said, it's promising, but I'd be lying to say that we've got it nailed down. Basically, it was a it was a strange it was a strange observation. We didn't. There were all these ideas of what would explain which which lineages can gain more uh, introns, um, and and they don't explain anything in the data that we can see. Uh, but then we have this this glaring thing where it's marine organisms. 
So it's all different. It's it's not one group. It seems to be very general across marine organisms. So we are very open to uh, better explanations than what we have. Um, it was a it was a phenomenal. It was an observation that we are trying to rationalize, and we don't have direct evidence for it. Okay. Yeah. So this is not like an a priori thing of aquatic animals, and it just it, it, it empirically seen. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Absolutely empirical. Not predicted by anyone ever. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Emily. Yeah, so I um, had, I'm oh, sorry, I think I unfroze. Okay, um, I saw that in your paper, you'd mentioned that introners were found in Pazizomycotina. I was also wondering, have you found any in, in any of the Basidios or is it only no. in Ascomycetes? Only in Ascomycetes and only in uh, Pazizos. Is there like any sort of evolutionary reason for that, do you think, or is it just kind of coincidental? So... It does seem to be the case that the stories that you find, and so Pazizo seems specifically to, they seem to have higher lateral gene transfer rates. Again, um, I, I need to I need to work harder. I need to dig harder to see if I can find it because it, it may actually exist, uh, the, the, a comparison. It's definitely the case that a lot of these stories about full met metabolic clusters being passed around between Pazizo mycotina, uh, our Pazizo mycotina, um, uh, rather than the others don't know I, and I and I should know this I don't I don't know why that's thought to be if if that they're thought to live in closer association with each other um because it, it seems that it's passing between pazizos and other pazizos um we have another story unrelated to this stuff in the lab where we see um we're looking at um leucine biosynthesis and there's a metabolic cluster that's been passed around and it's just it's all, all only there's one one copy of it that has only been passed between pazizos Many different lineages of Pazizos, but all Pazizos. I don't know why. Interesting. Thank you. I I will say it's um it's it's thought so when I when I presented this work in front of my colleague who works on Archaea, he said I don't buy it because like the um, oceans aren't particularly stable for DNA. In fact, free DNA is more common in uh in soils, and Pazizo live in soils. Um, I I think that there may not be many eukaryotes in the database that come from soils. Um, though, of course, it could, um, nematodes and things like that might be exceptional there. Um, so I don't know what it is about Pazizos, but it does seem to be, again, preliminarily, that Pazizos generally have more transfer. Uh, Rory, and then William. Hi. Yeah, I had a question of also about introners, specifically relating to the paper. I also, you mentioned this a little bit in the, in your lecture. Were, was there any, do introners have any known functions as RNA or as proteins as they're transcribed or translated, or are they no. seemingly random segments of DNA? No, like so they, they seem, please. So they, they seem to be, um, they seem to be mites, which are, um, you know, miniature inverted terminal re, uh, repeat transposable elements. Um, so, so they're non-autonomous. Uh, meaning they're dependent on machinery that's encoded often in longer transposable elements. Um, so I love I love the idea that they could have some function, but we have no evidence uh, even um, pushing in that direction at all. Um, uh, just sort of by Occam's razor, um, I don't see any reason to assume, as a, a, the first question I, I answered, I don't have any problem with the, the notion that they could be slightly costly and just, you know, at, slightly costly things can fix in the genome because basically selection has too many things to keep track of or if selection has too many things to deal with at one time because in any given genome because recombination is not free um you have if you have a good mutation that's linked to uh an intron or insertion um that may sweep to high frequency in the population before recombination allows you to pick and choose between them so in general, selection selection is real, real good, but it, it can't do it can't do uh, it's it's not omnipotent, and so I have no problem with it with the the possibility that these are just I, I mean I I I, I don't want to push aside the surprise the the idea that it's surprising I do think it's surprising, but it's surprising in the same way that it's surprising that hu the human genome is made out of fifty percent 
uh, transposable elements. And so if we accept that that's the case and that not every insertion was um, was beneficial, then we've we've accepted that transposable elements can can uh, succeed, that they can spread without any benefit to the organism. And so that's my starting hypothesis. Um, just by Occam's razor, it would be really exciting if they uh, if we could find something functional that they could they could do. It'd be really great. It'd be great for me. It'd get me a lot of funding. I'm I'm all for it. Uh, but so far, I don't have any any reason to think they do. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Actually, um, uh, the other person in the world I've met named Rory. Uh, I had a colleague with Rory with an I who unfortunately just left us for Oregon last month. But um, uh, the other colleague, uh, actually, he and I bonded over the fact. So he worked on long non-coding uh, RNAs, and he and I bonded over the fact that like. Uh, we both work, we, we have dedicated our lives to things that other people think are really important and we don't think are all that important. I mean, so 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 like a lot of people think introns, oh, they've got to be functionally important. And I'm just kind of like, eh, probably not most of them. And he was sort of the same way about long known coding RNAs. Yeah. That's interesting. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. William? Yeah, it was a really interesting talk and it was really, I've been drinking it. quite a bit. Um, I was Wonderful. just wondering, so you, you showed some pretty strong evidence that um, these early ancestral eukaryotes had a pretty high number of introns. And something that I'm just kind of confused about and, and wondering if you could talk a little bit more about is just like, how did they arise and what was kind of going on with them? Yeah, so 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 uh, let me confront head on the fact that I didn't really answer the question that my title laid out. And I do have an answer for it. I just kind of didn't get around to it. So. I've sort of pushed things back and said, okay, the origins of introns, introns everywhere is not with mammals. It's not with small effective population size. It's um, it's the origin of eukaryotes. So, so what gives there? Um, so again, I'll sort of give one of these annoying non-answers and then I'll give a better answer. Um, introns evolved from, uh, uh, there's good evidence that introns evolved from type two self-splicing introns and in bacteria, which are quite different beasts, but share enough uh, mechanistically that it's clear that they have an evolutionary relationship. Um, and so those are, uh, those are both the ancestor of modern introns and uh, modern spliceosomal introns and the ancestor of, um, retro elements. Um, and, and I'm not enough of a transposable element specialist to say this exactly as well as I'd, I'd like to. There's good evidence that they proliferated early in eukaryotes, that 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 retro elements proliferated early in eukaryotes. And so then something related to type two introns proliferated early in eukaryotes. We, we know about that. And so then the question is, um, did they proliferate before they lost their introniness? Modern retro elements uh, are no longer introns. They're just transposable elements that are not necessarily spliced. Uh, so all this required in terms of of, of understanding the story mechanistically is to say that that when these elements were uh, propagating early in eukaryotes, that they still were spliceable, they were still introns, and that basically they proliferated as self-splicing introns, and then that role was taken over by the spliceosome. Okay, so I'm not trying to wave this away. I'm just trying to cut down on the number of things we need to explain. So then, if that's so, well, we still need to uh, explain why they would have proliferated then. And then we under, need to understand why the splices on would have arisen. Why they didn't just stay, basically why they proliferated unprecedentedly and why they transformed unprecedentedly. Uh, yeah, we'll stay with that. And um, so uh, my hypothesis, which is not my hypothesis, it comes from Denal Hickey, like two years after I was born, and I thought I figured it out myself, and then I look back, and this is part of the problem of being an evolutionary biologist. Like people, there's a nice thing about being a molecular biologist is that nobody knew anything about uh, DNA sequence. Nobody had a DNA sequence until, you know, uh, around the time I was born, at least. Evolutionary biology, people were studying that, I mean, like natural history, people are studying way before Darwin. And, and so you think you have an idea and then you find out that somebody else had it in 1920. It's really, really irritating. Anyway, so uh, Denal Hickey's argument goes as follows. Um, in the absence of sex, well, let's start with, with viruses. If viruses couldn't burst out of the cell, then they'd have to be very careful about, they, they would have to basically not replicate, over replicate because if you don't burst out of the cell, then you're dependent on the health of that cell, right? If, if you're stuck in that cell, then you can't kill the cell because all the co nice copies of yourself you've made, you go down with those copies. 
Um, so transposal elements are sort of like that. In the absence of sexual reproduction, which is to say exchange of DNA with some other lineage, in the absence of sexual reproduction, transposable elements, if they proliferate a lot and are costly to the cell, they're going to go down with the ship. What you see is, uh, so minor splices on, uh, sorry, type two self-splicing bacterial introns have an ingenious way to deal with that, which is a lot of them, will, they, they specifically only insert into one sequence. And it's specifically, it's a sequence that's only present once in the genome. So what does that mean? It means it does not proliferate in the absence of sex. It's present in exactly one copy in, um, in the genome. And only when you get mixing of genomes through the rare bacterial sex, does it propagate. And then it only propagates to that one site. So it's got a self-limiting mechanism. So, so under those circumstances, basically the transposable element, you, the, you don't need a lot of, you don't need a, you don't need a lot to keep transposable elements at bay because they have been selected to not go crazy. All this changes dramatically with uh, meiosis, uh, ironically, another point on which Mike Lynch is wrong. Um, because if you have, if you have two, In bacterial sex, you basically get swapping of little bits of DNA. So you'll start with like, for the most part, you start with like, you know, if, if this is 100% of this genome and 100% of this genome, and then these two genomes have sex, you end up with something like not one genome has 90% of this genome and 4% of the other genome, and, and this one is vice versa or something like that. By contrast, in meiosis, it goes to 50-50, right? If these two have sex, then the, the, the offspring are very close to 50-50. What that means is every round of, of meiotic sex, you get rid of, you get away from a lot of your former associates. So if I'm on chromosome one, and my transposable element on chromosome one, and I go make a mess on chromosome three, I only have to live with chromosome three until, on average, two meio meiotic events. So that means that that you go from transposable elements being selected to be very choosy about when they proliferate to not being very choosy at all. To to basically the, the the to be a much more sort of closer to viral a viral situation where so long as you're not too costly uh that your overall number will increase over time if you propagate promis uh, promiscuously rather than with this very strict strict um specific situation so given donald Heike's ar argument i'm not surprised that introns would have uniquely proliferated early in, in eukaryotes and moreover if we think about what I've just argued is you didn't need you didn't need defense against transposable elements because transposable elements were them keeping themselves in check. So it may be that early eukaryotes was a particularly exciting time to be a transposable element because there was no host machinery yet to uh, you know. And if you if you've learned about host machinery that um, that that protects against transposable element insertion, it's uh, it's a remarkably kind of complex and elegant set of things. You don't, you're not going to evolve that overnight, right? It may be that methylation in large part arose for that, that purpose. That's a pretty big thing to evolve. So this could explain both why they take off and maybe why they'd be so successful and able to pr propagate to the point that you have five or 10 per gene. So there's the half, unfortunately, the longer half of, of my answer for you. That could be why they uh, uniquely proliferated in early eukaryotes. Then the question would be, why would the spliceosome take over? And there I would think, um, so, so these elements encode, they are rib ribozymes that can catalyze their own removal from transcripts. So they, they, have their, they bring their own splicing mechanism with them. Some of them also encode a protein that helps, but they are, they are self they're basically self-contained. If we think about in, in one of these bacteria, let's say that and uh, it's got an intron and occasionally that intron is going to mutate and, and, and it's going to lose the ability to splice itself out. Um, so we could have some helper protein that would help with this mutated intron, but that helper protein, there's not going to be, it's not going to have a lot of function because it's only going to be helping this one intron that's only going to mutate rarely. But now we go from one intron to the genome to 10 per gene in a 10,000 gene uh, genome, maybe 100,000 introns, um, all of which are mutating every generation. Now, suddenly, this is going to be a good way for a helper protein to make a living. So my guess would be that you get like more selection for helper, helper proteins, and then you get this feed forward loop. Once you've got a pro protein that's going to help a broken intron get spliced, now there's less selection, 
against the mutation that breaks an intron. And now, and so you have more and more suboptimal introns and more and more selection for helpers. So I imagine this sort of feed forward loop where mutation, where ongoing mutation selects for helpers and helpers uh, decrease the costs of mutations and you get more and more accumulation of mutations. And, and you have this sort of feed forward mechanism until you get us get those places out. That's the best I can do. It's too long ago. You it, invent it a seems... time machine that'll go back 2 billion years. I'm, I'm, I'm first on the list to take a ride. <laughs> yeah, well, that seems really interesting. Thank you so much. You bet. Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting thing that sort of arises uh, both in the conversation we had about the effective population size idea and what we've just been talking about, the origin of eukaryotes, and the thing that's on the screen, the origin, uh, which, by the way, I guess you don't need to keep looking at the slide, um, the origin uh, the origin of life, the origin of introns, uh, or the origin of life. Um, these are funny fields because uh, you can't get, you basically can never quite be, you can't be proven wrong in the same way, right? If you say, I think this protein is what causes this disease, somebody can prove it wrong. So what that means is in part that it selects for people who uh, like to argue a lot and you get very uh, contentious debates in these fields there. I, uh, a friend of mine from grad school went on to be an, an editor at Cell and as an editor at Cell, she attended a wide variety of different uh, conferences, right? So she could she could compare across communities and she came back from this, uh, this field, um, this conference that they had in New York, which was on the origins of life. And she called me and she said, are they always like that? And I didn't even have to ask what she meant. I said, yeah, they're they're always like that. Uh, in that conference, um, Tom Cavalier-Smith stood up and gave his talk. And then Kunin went not next, my old boss. And Kunin st stood up and he said, he's from he's uh, from Russia. He uh, he left actually around the time of the Re Russian, the revolutions in Russia and uh, the fall of the wall. Um, and he said, in old Soviet Russia, we had a, a proverb. Then it said, you have heard the propaganda and now you will hear the truth. So uh, the way the science is conducted in these communities is um, actually it's it's funny and we can laugh about it, but it's also kind of scarring uh, and uh, not pleasant um, and uh, shaped my career in ways that we can or not get into. All right, sorry to continue to BS, Ryan. Uh, hi, uh, great talk. <clears throat> um, so I was I was curious about a figure in your paper where you sit or like where you show that. Um, introners tend to insert into like lowly expressed genes and so mm -hmm. I know like or, like did you like look for like any like see if any of those genes were like functionally enriched for anything because I know they'd be difficult because like we did not are probably not that well annotated or anything but yeah just uh, thank you thank you for giving me an excuse um but uh I think we could have done it but we did not cool. um you, you're right the functional annotations wouldn't have been that good but uh, you know, you can do pretty well, like by just mapping it across functions, functions for ancestrally conserved genes, the functions seem to be well conserved. So it worked pretty well to take some eukaryote and uh, take, you know, the human or the, or the Arabidopsis, uh, mm -hmm. uh, known functions and kind of map them across. Um, it works well enough that I would, wouldn't decline to do it for that reason, but I don't think we did it. And there, I think our assumption is that it's not right. So that's probably a blind spot we have. I think people who have more interesting, exciting ideas about what might be going on, that these must have some functional role, they'd be more inclined to prioritize that, um, which is a great example of how your sort of hidden a priori model, your working hypothesis can keep you from doing interesting things. That'd be worth doing. Um, I'll talk to Landon about, about doing it. I agree that would be cool. Hi, I have a question. Um, right. what do you most enjoy about doing this work? That's a great question. Uh, I don't have a single answer. I enjoy so so many parts of it. Um, it's it's fun to like we you know we downloaded basically all of NCBI genomes and looked across everything. The the study I didn't get a chance to tell you about was even more extensive on this, characterizing the intron ohm, all the introns for all the eukaryotes. Um, but it's just kind of cool. It's like it's co cool to be able to sit at your laptop with a coffee and like and and get into that stuff. Um, and I've been doing it long enough that I'm pretty fast at coding, and it's just really gratifying. It really that's really nice. Uh, 
Um, I love the way that it, uh, I love how weird, I love how weird it is. Um, some stories I didn't talk about, you just like, particularly in some of these highly transformed ones, I mentioned Giardia, uh, which is the reason you can't drink, drink the waters, uh, drink the, drink the rivers. Um, Giardia is a, um, it's highly transformed. And if you look at it, the introns, like half of the introns have just split in half. So like exon one is on chromosome four and exon two is on chromosome seven. And then they like, so you have to transcribe them both and then they have, but they have complementary RNAs. So they basically find each other and form a hairpin that displaces them. I just, I, I, I just love it. I know uh, like that, that paper where we showed that, I don't know. I I'm pretty confident it doesn't have any use for any larger biological question, but I just love the, I love the bizarreness of, of it. Um, I love the interplay between in, in this work, the interplay between these sort of large fundamental rules, which have come up, effective population size, and how and how that affects things. Um, what is the selective value of these things? All those sorts of things. Um, uh, so so these these sort of unbreachable rules, but then all this just smudgy weirdness of the phenomena and the diversity of introns themselves. Um, I find that really stimulating. Um, I, I like the combination between rules and creativity. I'm a musician as well. And I love, I love impro improvising where there's like a set of rules and there's creativity. And I, I get the same thing from these weird stories. It's my best um, answer. You said you had to download like all the genomes from NCBI. Ooh, are you use like a supercomputer for that or? We have a cluster and the cluster has about, it has about 16 cores. So it might be about 16 times as powerful as your laptop. Although the cores are pretty old. So it's probably more like five or 10. So it's, um it's, uh, it, this work is actually accessible on, with, with fairly minimal um, research infrastructure uh, or, or, or minimal computing. Um, yeah, it's really not that bad. The genome, you know, because the genomes are, um, Mammalian genomes are three gigabases, but I think we didn't even bother looking at a lot of the mammals because it just takes so much computational time. A lot of the other genomes are like a few hundred megabases, um, and, and a lot of them are 20 megabases. Um, so 20 megabases, that's like what a, 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 a photo is four or five megabases, and MP3 is a couple megabases. Um, so the, the sizes of these, um, it's not overwhelming. Um, it's definitely done doable on clusters at, at University of Wisconsin. I mean, we do it on a cluster that basically my grad student built from old uh, parts from Google and had in his uh, had up on cinder blocks in his garage. That's our cluster. It's not uh, it's not all that costly. I'll just say one thing to that question. Um, computationally, co co computational stuff can get 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 costly. I'll talk about two ways in which it can get. Um, when you start needing a lot more power. One of those is if you're running a lot of simulations. So if you want, if you're like simulating molecules or or if you're simulating evolution, if you're trying to figure out evolutionary trees and you need to simulate, basically simulate the sequence a million times, that starts getting costly in terms of time. Um, another thing is uh, if you're trying to assemble genomes, so you're taking like a million different sequences or a billion different sequences and trying to trying to say where, where are the ones that all go together so you have to kind of compare a million sequences to a million sequences you know a million times a million um then things get really costly uh or really slow they require a lot of um a lot of power um so it can be it's kind of a thing of art to, to sort of guess what's going to be costly and not um but i'm happy to say that the kind of work we do we don't have much of a cluster the cluster is 10 years old now um 16 cores no big deal Okay, thank you. That gives a better picture of like what this work looks like on a day to day. Yeah, yeah. You basically you set up a script um, to to basically take an HTML like the um, so so to get a genome from H uh, from NCBI, you need a specific HTML, a specific address. But those addresses are systematic. Um, so so basically, you can you can create the address simply with a, a simple script if you just know what the accession number is. So if you've ever looked at uh, a sequence on NCBI, they have some random looking accession number. Basically, if you can take that accession number for a genome, you can build the, the address that you need to get. And then you just run this command on, on Linux, which is wget and the address, and it goes and gets you the genome. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, it's what are the things I love most about it? Like when I figured that out, I felt pretty cool, you know, uh, but it's really, it's not nearly as hard as you, as you initially imagined. Um, it takes practice and stuff, but it's not, 
Um, there's like, there's no advanced math or advanced statistics in it. It's just kind of learning how to do this, do this stuff. I, I, I still write in Perl, um, uh, which is a language that people laugh at people for still using because it's, uh, it's a dinosaur language, um, but it, it does everything I need. So I'm not, uh, there's some ways in which I'm sophisticated and other ways in which I'm just a simple caveman. Thank you. Thanks for the question. If nobody is asking, can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, so I don't know if I understand correctly, but it uh, looks like that the one point that in the evolution that the uh, introns are uh, 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 spread in the all over. And the, uh, if you, if I don't understand correctly, that now in the long time, the, in eukaryotes, the number of the exons, I mean, introns are well conserved. Is that is that is yeah so almost if you pick a random lineage it will and ask what's happening you know if you go up to a random eukaryote and say how's your intron right. how are your introns in the past million years right almost all of them will tell you well i've lost more than i've gained so it's basically if we followed one lineage it kind of goes like this it's good, it sort of goes down but then if it acquires a transposable element a, an intron or element then it'll jump up because you can create mm -hmm. In, right. in in much shorter evolutionary times, you can create thousands or tens of thousands of new introns. Right, uh, and then it sort of trickles I down. See. Okay, but so it's, it's, um, I'm sorry. So that's kind of interesting that you mentioned that uh, it's uh, uh, possible to gain and hard to loss in the first theory, right? To generate the intron, but it looks like that uh, after that you you fix the number of the introns, there might be the, some mechanism to kind of keep that uh, away of taking more introns. Of, 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 of avoiding intron gain or of avoiding Yeah, intron? avoiding intron gains. Is that, is that possible or? Uh... I mean, anything is possible. I don't, yeah. um, so the question, so I think the question would look like, yeah, it's, so so that'd be kind of like if you already have an int uh, if you already have a bunch of introns are you less likely to gain some more introns in um, some some certain point in the probably to avoid the functional changes in the in the entire organisms for example so i or, or, i don't know because if that the intron gain is not affecting the uh, function of the proteins, they might you might want to see that uh, increasing the intron gains in the genes that might not affect the some uh, uh, changes, uh, drastic changes in the function or survival. Yeah, so I would, we, we, that's probably that that could probably explain uh, or something closely related to that why we see more intron gains in lowly expressed than highly expressed genes if highly expressed genes are more um are more uh important in in general i would so i don't think that i i guess what i would say is that um these kind of dynamics where we can imagine basically that the cost to so so i think if we model that we can model that as the cost of getting one more intron uh would go up that the, that the cost to a single intron would go up with the number of introns. That that could be, definitely. But I don't know how much of the data can it can explain because that still struggles to figure out how humans got to 200,000 introns in the first place, whereas mm -hmm. other lineages only got, like, are only at 1,000 introns. Because presumably it, it would both require that the curve in, in humans is very different, that for some reason they can tolerate a lot uh, I guess I should say we gave up there that I'm not a human, that we can tolerate uh, many, uh, many more introns than other lineages, but also it would have to explain, it would need to be like, well, up to 200,000, they're not all that costly, but after 200,000, 200,001 is so costly that even over hundreds of millions of years, you will not fix a new one. Um, so the dynamics you suggest could be a contributor, uh, and I have no evidence that they are not a contributor, uh, but but I don't see, it's hard for me to reconcile with that being a major, there's like so many questions here that we can't answer, so many interesting ideas that we have evidence neither against or for. 
But I think if we focus on what is the main explanation for why we have these broad scale patterns, I, see. I don't see a way to explain basically what I said, why we get to 200,000 and then stop just stasis, right? Because yeah. if, if the 200,000th intron was pretty costly, then we'd expect mm -hmm. over time it would get lost again, right? So so we might this could explain why we'd be at exactly 200,000, but it doesn't explain the lack of change. If introns are more costly when you have more of them, then we'd expect more loss once you have more of them. More like a higher rate of loss per one. But that's not what we see in vertebrates. We see in we see that vertebrates have hardly any loss or gain. I see. So it could explain the sort of why do you stay at a, a constant number? It could explain an equilibrium, but it can't explain the stasis of specific elements. I see. I see. I have another question. So Great. do you know what is frequent to happen in the event of, for example, say there's a gene, gene duplication or, for example, like, you know, in the telos, telos, there was the multiple duplications of the entire genome. Um, and whenever there is that there is that duplication, do you see that the introns in each gene, like, are they conserved at the same rate or do they do they change? Good. So, so one thing I should say is I, I, um, I fail to explain exactly what I mean by an intron gain. If you have a gene duplication, is that an intron gain? By my definition, no. And, and, and the reason is what I'm interested in is how do you get a new intron? How do you go from one day having an exon like this and the next day having an intron like that or vice versa? So when you have a genomic duplication, you just duplicate all the introns in, in situ. So you have more introns in the gene genome. Um, but I don't, I'm interested in gene duplication, but I'm not interested in the fact that that's one more intron. But you ask a, a better question than that, which is once there's duplication, do we see changes in the dynamics of intron loss and gain? So um, to, to, I'm, I'm guessing there you're thinking about this notion that once there's a gene duplication, um, that the two copies are under less selection because basically just one of them could take over the old role and the other one can do something new or just evolve away. And so that could suggest that if introns are of particular, if either keeping your old introns or not gaining new introns is of particular importance for function, gene function, that after duplication, you could see more loss of the old ones and or more gain of the new ones. Um, that's an extremely important thing to test um, that because uh, it's a great way to test the notion that there's a general lack of association with function, my kind of generally neutral model. Uh, there were some attempts to, uh, there basically was a paper out of the Kunin lab before I joined the Kunin lab. And then I showed that the paper was wrong. Uh, and then there was another paper that I was a reviewer. I was, an, I was a reviewer on, so it was my uh, job to catch that there was a mistake and I did not catch that where there was a mistake and it got published. And then I had to, uh, and then I published something saying, so I was a reviewer on this. So, you know, no harm, no foul, but uh, this isn't correct. So um, there was an attempt, you know, so it, it, but that's not really an excuse. It's a long time ago now. Uh, now it should be totally possible to do. I just, I haven't prior, prioritized it, but I agree it's an important thing to do. Thank you. There's a question from, uh, Cheryl, Cheryl, Sherlin, Sherlin. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, you said that uh, your mic's not working well. Do you want to, me to read your question, or is your mic working now? If you don't talk, I'll assume um, you want me to read the question. Can Can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, so I have a more general question, I guess. So I'm just curious if it is possible that organisms that are known to have lesser introns now. So maybe they have more introns back then, but suddenly that like some kind of evolutionary event happened that caused them to lose more amounts of introns than expected. Great, thank you for the question. It's definitely the case that if you look over long periods of time, that you see that like the 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 deep ancestors of S. cerevisiae. If you if you trace S. cerevisiae back a billion years, there's definitely more introns there. So in that long history of a billion years, there's been more, a lot more intron loss than there's been intron gain. Uh, in terms of your question, the, the other parts of your question are, is it sudden? Um, and that's another thing 
I, I, I hate that I keep saying I should look into that, but I haven't. But I just do want to say I'm the only person in the field. <laughs> like I don't have time to do everything. Um, but it's good. We like because the, the it's it's an important question. Is it that do you see we I, I've said that you see these bursts of gain that basically most lineages like ourselves don't have an intron or and so don't gain any introns. And then you have lineages that gain thousands at the same time. Do you see the same thing in terms of intron loss? In my answer to Aaron, um, I pointed out that in the specific case of Cerevisiae, that there's not evidence that there's a moment when it all changes, that you can see as you trace the ancestors that it's happened kind of gradually. So that's an answer for one species. Um, also in uh, Entamoeba, um, which I mentioned briefly, there's evidence that there's ongoing loss. So it's not a single event where there's a massive jettisoning of introns. Um, and I think in nematodes, you similarly see that there that the, that there's that introns are lost over long evolutionary periods of time. So that would suggest that if you had to if you had to put your money on one model, it would be that there are lineages where, for still unknown reasons, there are high like per per unit time rates of loss, and that and that persists over long periods of time. That they're just lineages that for eons lose introns more readily. And there are any lineages like vertebrates that for eons hardly lose any introns at all. What's going on there? I would suggest so 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 an expansion on the uh, the the notion that intron losses are weird events. So I said it's basically a weird thing to do to precisely divide uh, delete an intron all of a sudden, all at once. There are some things um that that's true, but there are some things that are going to influence that. So one of those is um uh, so, so if what's happening when you lose an intron is you have the intron containing copy, and then you make a cDNA, which is a reverse transcriptase makes a, an intronless cDNA copy, basically makes a DNA copy of an mRNA. And then that recombines, uh, to basically to swap out the intron containing copy for the intronless copy. Um, if that's how we lose introns, then immediately we can identify several differences across lineages that are going to determine um, uh, its relative rate of intron loss. One is how much reverse transcriptase do you have? So if you don't have any reverse transcriptase in the species, you'll never make cDNAs. You'll never make. You'll never lose introns. Um, and and that is going to depend on a bunch of things, including how many retro elements you have in your genome. Second one would be what is the rate of um, of homologous recombination? So Dave uh, asked a question about um, Cerevisiae having lost all the introns because of homologous recombination. One of the great things about Cerevisiae is that if you want to stick a genome in the gene, uh, a gene in the genome, you just kind of give it the DNA and it says, "Oh, great, I'll stick that in here somewhere." Um, so there seems to be lots of homologous recombination in Cerevisiae, which could be consistent with it recombining with cDNA is more often consistent with it losing more introns. Um, another thing is going to be, um, so so human introns are huge. So so there, there's a species where the, all the introns are 15 nucleotides. So to recombine between a 15 nucleotide intron and the cDNA, probably that's not too big of a problem because it's not that far. If it's five kilobases, then to precisely loop out that five kilobases so that this exon lines up with this part of the cDNA and this exon lines up with this part of the cDNA is probably going to be, it's it's just going to be less likely to happen, right? Um, and so the length of the intron is another thing that can matter. So in one of my, by now, classic non-answers, um, there are a whole bunch of different factors that we would expect to lead to differences between lineages in uh, in terms of rates of intron loss. And we do see evidence for some of them. We see that within a lineage, shorter introns are more likely to be lost. High, more highly expressed genes are more likely to lose introns. Um, I think there's some evidence that uh, from Denki News Lab that um, lineages with more retro elements are more likely to lose introns. So 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 there's the pieces of it, that, um, but we don't have a, I can't, if you give me a lineage, I can't precisely guess how fast it will be losing introns. Thank you. You bet. Can I ask another question? Unless somebody else wants to go. Um, okay, I will ask it. Okay, so last year we had a fellow come and speak at Colloquium, and he talked about the evolutionary impact of same sense mutations. So like mutations that are 
the same amino acid is being made. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. what he talked about is how that can slow the process of making that specific, you know, whatever needs to be made uh, with that transcript dramatically enough to actually have an evolutionary impact. And so what I'm wondering is if you have done any um, looking into the impact of losing introns on producing proteins at a faster rate, you know, without them having to do splicing. No, that's a great idea. Um, we've been a little bit hesitant to do it because, because um, if you compare, we until basically this new PNAS paper that came out two months ago, um, we didn't have many instances in which we had a, a brand new, a brand new loss gain event. Um, so, so the problem could be like, if like, let's say losing an intron means that you express actually probably good. Let's say losing an intron means that you transcribe the gene faster, more. Well, the overall transcript level of that gene is, um, is probably under selection. It can't just fluctuate like this. And so what that means is if you lose the intron and it bumps you up a little bit, probably over time, the promoter is going to change or synonymous mutations and other things are going to change to bring you back down to that level. So that what that means is if you're comparing between uh, a species that kept the intron and a species that lost the intron a million years ago, um, that the differences you see may not be causal because we expect there to be these sort of secondary changes. Um, but it should be done now that we have good things. So I can't believe how many times I've said, that's a great idea. I should have done it by now, but it's a great idea. I should have done it by now. Uh, we don't have it. We, uh, I, I would say that the synonymous mutation stuff is really uh, exciting and upsetting because if synonymous mutations can have as important an impact as some of that new work says, uh, then that just, just everything is on the tape back on the table. Right? We, but we, as a, uh, evolutionary molecular biologists have made assumptions about sort of the magnitude that a given kind of mutation could matter. And that suggests even the ones that we thought were least important are important. Um, and so that there's like a huge, like the notion that synonymous mutations are essentially neutral. In fact, that we use synonymous mutations as a clock to basically figure out how much time has passed, say, since two genes duplicated or even since spe two species changed. If it's not neutral or nowhere near neutral, then like all that stuff's gotta be revisited. And I haven't followed that debate closely. I know there's some people that don't really buy that data. Some of it, um, definitely some of it seems much more exciting than we thought it was. So the question is whether, the question is whether it's just an exciting new phenomenon or whether it's like a paradigmatic shift and we gotta re-examine a whole lot of old data because our assumptions have been so far off. Uh, but it's definitely exciting stuff. And I mean, I, I feel like, I feel like coming in at the beginning of the genomic era, as I did, where I basically I was around doing this when the first genomes came out. Back then, there were these sort of simple, simplish models, maybe not like among molecular biologists, but among molecular evolutionary biologists, which is like, well, what matters is protein coding uh, and um, and the specific protein that's encoded. And now it's just there's so many levels of regulation that it's it's hard to even know what's important, right? You've got mRNAs, you've got siRNAs, you've got uh, open, opening and closing of chromosome. You've got like differential use of, uh, of enhancers, just the system. Like we should have been able to guess that the system was going to be complex if it could give rise to something like a brain. And yet we sort of, we didn't really appreciate just how many things there were. Uh, it's, I find it overwhelming. You know, I feel like, like the world that we're born into, we get accustomed to, and then things get more complicated. And then we get a little overwhelmed by that, which is why we need young people, um, who aren't, who aren't suffering from that kind of whiplash uh, to put carry things forward. Uh, but to me, the, the, the how many different genomic phenomena, phenomena have been shown to be important is just overwhelming. So, and that's just one more and maybe one of the most overwhelming ones. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Well, if there are any more questions, I'm going to ask a crazy question. Um, so is there any way you could, somebody could experimentally put one of these transposable elements, even without, with 
you know, without the protein, without the transposase into some organism and track uh, presumably the formation of new introns? So that's been done, uh, but they didn't know the transposase and it didn't work. Um, <laughs> so we need that we need the transposase. I think uh, and Landon, the, my co-first author on the PNS paper, uh, he would know the stuff better. Um, but I think we have some instances where we basically think we know what's going on. Uh, part of the problem is, you know, when you dig around, we haven't really gone through and said, okay, do we have a do we have a tractable model here? Do we have a model that somebody's working on um, that that they could go in? And we probably do because there are enough model algae. We just kind of haven't really done it yet. Basically, to look at a lineage um, that somebody has in the lab where this could be introduced, or even or even not introduced, just we could we could look for we could take a, a system where we already know transposition is happening. Um, and see if we can catch some new, brand new in the in the lab events. Right, that'd be that would that is very well worth uh, doing. Um, I tried within some polymorphism data to look. So Micromonas was the species I said that they uh, that they sequenced because of its primary production importance, and that's where they discovered introners. Lo and behold, um, uh, I tried by looking at worldwide diversity to try to find new insertions. That that had were recent, and what I found was no evidence for that whatsoever. So even though that's one of the most recent ones, it appears that the proliferation event is over. Um, that that it's not ongoing. That it's it's still recognizable because they're ninety five percent identical to each other. But you don't find ones that are uh, that are one hundred percent identical and still only present in part of the population. So that suggests that there has not been. We haven't looked systematically enough, but it suggests that there's not been, um, uh, uh, that, that it's not ongoing. So that suggests that if you use that system, even though it initially looks promising, that it probably isn't trans still transposing in the lab. Mm -hmm. Except that maybe what's happening is it, it's the transposase is still competent, but it's been shut down by the host machinery. So if you took it and you put it in yeast, then it would work. I don't know. Uh, but I agree that that would be great, great to do. Um, can't believe how many times I've said, yeah, we should do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I'll come do a postdoc. Fantastic. <laughs> Plenty of space in my lab. <laughs> oh, are there questions? Ryan has a question. Oh. More questions, Ryan. No, I was just clapping. Oh, you're clapping, clapping hands. Oh, okay. For the clap. Yay, <laughs> thank you. It, it was thank really you very good. much for your time. Thank it was you. wonderful. Thank you. Thanks everyone for their questions and for the time. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, sorry, thank it's not a person. I'll try to make it up there some other time. Thank you so much. Hope everybody survives the storm. <laughs> we try. <laughs> Thanks to the facilitators. Much appreciate it. Talk to you later. So much.